Honorable Minister, Mr. Salman Kushit, Mr. Qureshi, Mr. Nainan, Mr. Bharat Wapdu, I think Mr. Prabhu probably is excusing himself. I must first of all say thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to chair this session, which is a very crucial importance. Adam Smith wrote his Wealth of Nations and the <coughs> Declaration of American Independence, both of them in the same year. It was supposed to signify a new sense of economics and a new sense of politics. Politics and economics are expected to go together for the greater benefit of the mankind. It assumes, both of them, that the individual is a rational individual and the markets as well as those who exercise power will be guided by rational thinking. Democracy is almost prevalent in more than 130 countries today as also the increasing number of free market economies. But over a period of time, the rational behavior of the individual seems to have taken the back seat. Neither economics is perfect nor politics is perfect. Capitalism and democracy share the same internal logic. Free markets and representative democracy were both assumed to operate best when individuals made rational decisions. And both shared common enemy, despotic rulers, capable of using arbitrary power to confiscate property and restrict liberty. If political and economic freedoms have been siblings in the history of liberty, it is the incestuous relationship of wealth and power that poses the deadliest threat to democracy anywhere in the world. And this is a problem that is being faced in most of the countries, particularly those emerging democracies. Al Gore, in his famous book called uh, The Assault on Reason, this is what he says, the American experience, of course. This is, that is what happened throughout human history. Over and over again, wealth and power have become concentrated in the hands of a few who consolidate and perpetuate their control at the expense of many. The default pattern has appeared in many variations and has been interrupted by rare and memorable exceptions, including ancient Athens and Roman Republic. The derivation of just power from the consent of the governed depends upon the integrity of the reasoning process through which that consent is given. If the reasoning process is corrupted by money and deception, then the consent of the governed is based on false premises. What has happened, if you look at the pages of history, is that power corrupts, and not only power, wealth also corrupts. And when both of them join together, the fate of many democracies depends upon the good character of the leadership that we have. Now, today we have taken up a question. One, of course, most of us agree, including the political parties, the need for electoral reforms. <coughs> Unfortunately, it has been taking a lot of time. The official reason given to these proponents of electoral reform is that there is no consensus. I would appeal to the minister, you cannot wait for consensus in these matters. Please bear it in mind that if you think what is good for the country is good, with your majority, please have these reforms taken seriously. It's in the interest of the nation. It's in the interest of all political parties. Now, now let us come to the today's topic, political funding. This is again a problem faced by the rich nations as well as poor nations. I've had occasions to see some of the African nations' elections and also the American elections. But I must tell that money is increasingly becoming a very powerful tool with the result that the voters do not have free choice. They are 
led by the external forces and they are not able to really elect meritorious people. I am sure all parties will agree with this, but I think like in Alice in Wonderland, we do not know how to go and where to go. But it is necessary that we take up this issue seriously and I would like to compliment the Foundation for Restoration of National Values for organizing this meeting and inviting eminent persons to talk on the subject. As far as my own suggestion is concerned, I'll come at the end when I do the summing up. But I strongly believe that there is a need for immediate action in ensuring that the funding of political parties is done in such a manner that it does not lead to autocracy or lead to, it does not lead to uh, corruption in the exercise of power. Now we have eminent persons to deal with. First of course we have the Honorable Minister himself. He has a very rich political legacy. As you all know, his grandfather was the President of India and his father was the Governor of Karnataka. And he himself has a very rich educational legacy, a product of DPS, St. Stephen's and Oxford, apart from being an eminent lawyer of Supreme Court now. The country is lucky to have such a person, fairly young person, to lead the Ministry of Law, to bring about the reforms very badly needed. And I'm sure that he will take up this task seriously. And I'm sure he will also consider immediate action to cleanse the money power from the Indian political scene. Then we have Mr. Qureshi, a good friend of mine and my successful and able successor. And I don't think I have to say much about it. All of you know about him. He has proved that the Election Commission continues to exercise its neutral power effectively in the conduct of elections. When I went to Pakistan in 2004 to attend a, a conference, I would like to say that many political leaders were so joyous to say, to stress that the Indian election system has resulted in the smooth transition of power every time that the election is held. So while we have a very sound election management body, but that is not enough. As one of my friends mentioned, that in India democracy starts with the election and ends with the election. That is not the purpose, I suppose. Democracy has to be vibrant throughout, in between the elections as well. So uh, it is necessary that political parties which are integral to a good and vibrant democracy conduct themselves, the political parties conduct themselves in a manner that people are convinced that they are really going to work for the progress of the nation. So let, let me congratulate Mr. Qureshi for the recent conduct of the elections. And of course, he will be retiring like me very soon. I am sure he will not allow his retirement life to be in idle days, and I am sure he will also take an active interest in improving the quality of public life in this country. Third speaker is Mr. Nainam. All of you know him as a man uh, in the, from the finance world. He has, he's the chief editor of the Business Standard, and he has been with various earlier publications, the publications Financial Times, yeah, sorry, Economic Times, and the Business World. He has always uh, impressed everybody by his fresh thinking in matters relating to finance. And I'm sure you must have heard many of his analysis during the budget times. He has served as a chairman or member of the governing board of a number of non-profit bodies and trusts in the fields of media, environment, education and public affairs. Media is a very important tool in the functioning of any democracy. Unfortunately, in the last few years, certain corrupting elements have brought a bad name. The paid news is the one I am referring to and it's very unfortunate that we have not been able to tackle it effectively although there is sort of a lot of realization now that it needs to be tackled very seriously. I am sure Mr. Nainan with his rich experience will also talk about how the political funding can be improved because it's, it's essentially an economic matter with a political bias. So with his rich experience, 
we expect him to contribute for some specific changes in the existing system. With these words, may I say thank you very much for giving me an opportunity. I have been told that the e speaker will be requested to speak for 15 minutes. Thereafter, we'll have an interactive session for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then I will do the summing up at the end. Thank you very much.